Good afternoon, happy Earth Day, and welcome to our not actually final, final <laughs> lecture series of this semester. My name is Linda Shai, I'm happy to host you today. Before we get started, can we have um, Leticia Fusel to come give the land acknowledgement today? Thank you, good afternoon. I'm gonna try that again, good afternoon. <laughs> All right. Um, my name Hi. All right. Uh, my name is Leticia Fussell. She, her pronouns. My name is um, the Director for Diversity and Inclusion for the College of Architecture, Art, and Planning. I wanted to start off with the land acknowledgement. Uh, so Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gaidakono, the Cayuga Nation. Uh, the Gaidakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Ganakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Ganakono past, people past and present to these lands and waters. Thank you. Thanks so much, Leticia. All right. so. Um, this is, for those of you who may be here from outside of AAP, this is the running lecture series for the Department of City and Regional Planning here. Our normal lecture series today would be the last one, but we actually have added not one, but two additional lecture series for the next two Fridays. You have heard me talk about the one next week, which will be from Dr. Sergio Montero, who is from the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. Um, he originally was going to come here in person to give his talk. Unfortunately, his visa was denied at the last moment, and so he will not be able to travel here from Toronto. He will be giving his talk virtually instead and I hope that um, many of you will come. The, and then we have the, on the 6th of May, one final additional lecture that has been planned. It is from Professor Gerald Ezel, who is an assistant professor in Africana. Um, he, is, he does work at the intersections of planning, um, sociology, public health, especially dealing with the Flint water crisis in Detroit and Detroit community development there. So, that also promises to be a really exciting talk, and that one will be in person. So all of these you can apply towards your attendance as well as the use of your essay. In light of the fact that our series now is going to end on May 6th, you can choose to deliver your final essay as late as May 13th. If you choose for this to be your final lecture, uh, you are welcome to start writing your essay and submit it anytime before the 13th. If you have any questions about that final essay, I've said it many times before, but uh, if you have any questions about it, feel free to ask me. If you have questions about your attendance so far, please get in touch with Alexis. Without further ado, let me introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Luis Aguirre Torres, who is the Director of Sustainability for the City of Ithaca, where he is in charge of the design and implementation of our decarbonization and climate justice strategy. He is also the co-chair of the New York State Climate Impact Assessment Society and Economic Technical Working Group. Prior to joining the city of Ithaca, he was the president and CEO of Green Momentum, a think tank organization specialized in climate change legislation, as well as renewable energy deployment and financing. In 2012 and 2016, he was recognized by the White House for his work promoting climate justice in Latin America. I think um, most of us know, and I see that we have a lot of people here today, you are all concerned with a challenges of climate change and decarbonization. And yesterday I just had a guest speaker who is um, a legislative staffer for Cori Bush, who is a member of the congressional squad team and one of the biggest advocates of Green New Deal. And it, when he was talking, he said, you know, when you look at cities and their decarbonization goals, you can't really find other ones more prominent than Boston and the city of Ithaca. So we are really at the forefront of thinking about climate change here locally. And Luis is leading that fight, doing incredible things in just a short amount of time that he's been here. And we're very excited to welcome him to give our guest lecture today on uh, Earth Day. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. If you can't, just let me know. Uh, also, uh, I speak very fast. I have an accent and I swear a lot. So uh, if I say anything, I hope I don't offend anybody. If I do, well, fuck it. Anyway, uh, so uh, I, I want to say, I want to start by saying that I truly appreciate this, you know, the opportunity to be here. Uh, oh, for camera purposes, should I stand somewhere here? <laughs> so ju ju just don't move. Okay, that's good. Uh, so anyway, I don't know where I was. What, what was I saying? <laughs> Crap, I really lost it. Anyway, so I'll, I'll go back to the beginning. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. I think that's where I was. Yeah. So I, I just want to share with you what we've been doing in the past year. Uh, the city of Itaca is definitely leading the nation. I am very happy and very proud to say that. Uh, you know, we did something uh, probably you know, that nobody has dared to do before. It's not that nobody thought about it, it's just that we figure out how to do it, or at least how to try to do it last November. And since November, you know, it's been crazy. You know, we've been making so much progress, mostly because a lot of people came on board, you know, with the idea of, of, of helping us. So uh, that's me. Uh, just very quickly more about me. Uh, I am originally from Mexico. Uh, I went to school in England, then I moved to Israel and California and different places. And somehow I ended up here again. Uh, but a lot of my work was focused on policy. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with the Schwarzenegger administration for a little bit, with the Obama administration for a little bit. And I have seen you know, how policy has been developed at the federal level, at the state level. Uh, I work with Latin America, so I work in global development for a while. And now I'm here working on, on, uh, at the city level. But it's very interesting because I was, I was telling somebody just before uh, the lecture that when you look at Energy systems, for example, you know, there is a way of describing it that it starts with, you know, with, with generation, you know, how we generate electricity, and then the transmission lines, you know, that are really, really big, and then the distribution grid that we see here in the city, and then we see the utility pole that connects to the electrical panel in your house, and then from there it goes to everything else, right? And, and, and if you look at it, it, it would seem overwhelming to think that we can shift from coal to renewable energy. We can get these huge power plants to move to do a, the same thing, but with different fuel. But really, what is truly overwhelming when you think about it is to change everything that we do at home. The real complexity starts at the electrical panel in every building. And the same thing goes for policy. Because if you think about what we've been doing for climate change, we can think about Paris, you know, the Paris Agreement, and how we all showed up with this huge ambition. You know, we were gonna defeat climate change. But then, you know, we were negotiating and we ended up pledging slightly less. And then after that, you know, we had to come back to our countries and negotiate, you know, with the executive and and then, you know, there were some political repercussions to, to our commitment, so we needed to lower the bar a little bit more. And then the president needed to negotiate with Congress, and then we needed to, you know, compromise even more. And then after that, he had to go to the states. And then, yeah, we cannot have such an aggressive goal. And then he came down to cities. And it's the same thing as with the electrical panel. You know, In the cities is where the real complexity starts. It's where it really gets complicated to do this. So part of what I want to share with you is how we are addressing you know, that complexity. And we are experimenting. You know, A lot of this nobody has tried before. But you know, we want to do it and see what happens. So, does this does it move? It did. Oh, cool. I don't know what I did to move, but anyway, it moved, and we might be stuck in there forever. Uh, so this is the, the Green New Deal resolution. Uh, I don't know if, if, if you have been in Ithaca for long enough. Some of you might have. Some of you may be here just for a few months. But what happened was, in 2019, in January, uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Markey from Massachusetts, they got together and presented the United States and the world with a, new Green new deal, with a Green New Deal. And the idea was to retake those ideas from you know, 1934, where we were you know, changing the way we were doing things, trying to create jobs, trying to bring you know, benefit to the community. So what we did you know, back then uh, was to create a, a series of programs that were destined to change things for the better in the United States. So we did the same thing. You know, the Green New Deal was this idea that we could fight climate change at the same time that we could fight other issues, such as 
climate, uh, sorry, uh, social injustice, economic inequality. And, you know, there was no way this resolution was going to go through Congress. There was no way. It's too progressive. And that's exactly what happened. But what could argue that what they really wanted was to start a movement? And they did. Because they partnered with the Sunrise Movement. And the Sunrise Movement turned out to be one of the most powerful forces that we have seen in the environmental movement since the formation of Greenpeace in 1968. What they did was to bring pressure toward the complexities to the cities. And there was a chapter of Sunrise Movement here in Ithaca. And they went after the mayor. And they told him, dude, you have to do something to fight climate change. We cannot just be partial. We cannot be just watching the world trying to save humanity from climate change. Eventually, the mayor considered that, you know, that is true, we need to do something, talk to the Common Council, and the city passed the Ithaca Green New Deal. And that's the thing. That's the Ithaca Green New Deal. And, and if you look at it, you know, it's full of ambition, you know, and that's the pledge. But how do we do this? And the answer is nobody knew. Nobody had any clue. And the problem with that was that immediately after, uh, then we had uh, COVID. So everything stopped. We didn't do anything for two years. But Sunrise Movement, you know, kept it going. A lot of people, volunteers, kept it going. And eventually, you know, came 2021, the city decided, OK, the first thing that we need to do is to hire a sustainability director. That would be me. And, you know, the first day on the job, they told me, like, here is this piece of paper. This is the Green New Deal resolution. Go crazy, kid. And, and it, was, it was funny because the first thing that you see is, is <laughs> it, it's carbon neutrality by 2030. That is totally nuts. Uh, the next thing that you see is that you need to address social injustice. Like, we've been trying to do that for a while, right? So it was kind of overwhelming. And what you see is, you know, this is the translation of what we needed to do. We needed to make sure that there was an absolute transformation in the economy, in society, that we were, we were going to start looking at things very differently. But they needed to be aware that there was going to be a massive transformation in the infrastructure. We cannot conceive of energy in the same way. We cannot conceive of waste in the same way. We need to start thinking very differently, and we need to think very smartly how to use money. I'm not entirely sure that the city council understood the impact of what they were going after. But anyway, we started, and the first thing that we needed to do was to you know, define what the objectives were. So one thing that we need to do is now what? reduce carbon emissions. So yeah, that is the goal. But if you notice, you know, we're not reducing 100% of carbon emissions, because we might not be able to do that. So OK, then we need to make sure that we use less energy. So we need to reduce energy intensity, perhaps by 50%. But what we need to do is to make sure, OK, next one. <laughs> one more, please, if you can. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what we need to make sure is that you know, there is uh, less carbon for every unit of energy. So at the end of the day, the Ithaca Green New Deal resolution in terms of infrastructure, in terms of carbon neutrality, can be reduced to three basic objectives. One of them is to reduce carbon emissions at least by 80% to reduce energy intensity at least by 50%, and to reduce carbon intensity by 90%. Those are the objectives of the Ithaca Green New Deal. But then it gets interesting, because we need to look at it from the human point of view. And then we need to redefine the Ithaca Green New Deal. We need to start thinking what the Ithaca Green New Deal actually means for people. So we can start thinking about it in the same way that, that we thought about the vaccine. You know, Because if you think about it, uh, the moment that the world was being you know, infected by COVID, we didn't think it would be possible to develop a vaccine in six months. And we did. And one would think that the real achievement was the actual vaccine. But I would like to say that one of the greatest achievements of the recent years was to figure out the logistics to really take the vaccine to 7 billion people. It's just like the moon, la the moon landing, if you think about it, right? The president says in uh, 1962, we're going to make it to the moon. You know, it's something that we want to do. And that precipitated changes in the federal government, in every state government. It changed everything in the United States. We changed procurement processes. We changed the way we engage the private sector. We changed the way we look at the cosmos. Everything changed. And yeah, we landed on the moon, but that's the least important part. And that is the key with these mission-oriented projects. Because at the end of the day, when you have a project like that, 
It is all about how you do it, and it's as important as what you are doing. So the Ithaca Green New Deal is a mission-oriented project, but it's also a collaborative approach with the community. It is something that we're doing together, because it's impossible to do it as government. It's impossible to do it as individuals. It is something that we do all together. But at the same time, if we're going to be working on that, we need to make sure that we're redefining the rules of engagement. So we need to redefine the social contract. Somehow we need to think differently about the role each one of us has in the fight against climate change. Next one, please. And then, okay, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and then we need to think about what it means to work with the community and what it really means, the, the fact that we're dealing with human beings, right? It's all about the people. So it's all about the people and the connections and the values and the principles because that's what the Green New Deal is about. So when we talk about the Ithaca Green New Deal, we cannot do it without thinking about social capital. We need to think about elevating social capital. That's what really matters. It's not the political agenda. It's not even carbon emissions. We're talking about people. We're talking about social capital. We need to do things differently. But at the same time that we're doing those things differently, we need to start thinking about what it means you know, to work together towards a single goal and what that goal could be. You know, we're talking about equity. We're talking about justice. We're talking about sustainable prosperity. So when you think about the Ithaca Green New Deal, think about a mission-oriented collaborative approach to carbon neutrality through which we are redefining the social contract, trying to elevate social capital and promote a different kind of world, one world where justice, equity, sustainable prosperity, as in ample abundance that we share with the community, are available to everybody. So the job is not all about energy, it's not all about money, it's about people. And also, it is important to say that we as government, we need to accept the role that we should have today. One more, please. Okay. Because the role that we have is that of a convener. Right now, what we're trying to do is to make sure that this happens. But we need to make sure that the right connections, the right partnerships are there so we can actually make it possible. So we need to think about how to mobilize you know, our capabilities from the public sector. And finally, we need to understand that what we're trying to do here in Ithaca, and I love when people say that Ithaca is ahead. Of, of everybody else in the United States, because it, it is true, but nobody can say that we're doing this alone, no? Because at the end of the day, we are part of a global imperative. This is much bigger than us, but at the same time, you know, we're not deciding for everybody. There is a different model of governance around this. So that's what the Ithaca Green New Deal is, if I were to put it in words. So one, we can talk about reducing emissions, energy intensity, carbon intensity, but the other one is this. This is what we're trying to do. Next one, please. Okay. Uh, we are in the state of New York, and you know there are things that are debatable, but the truth is, right now, you have California and you have New York fighting it out. You know, right now, we're trying to decide who's the best at fighting climate change. And the governors are competing every day, making announcements, but the truth is that we are actually making an effort. We are truly making an effort in, in, in you know, fighting this. And, the governor and, you know, through every single agency, part of the state government, including NYSERDA, we're making commitments to make things different. And what you see here, the little box on the bottom, it basically says, you know, these are the commitments that the governor presented during the state of the state address that are part of the scoping plan for the government from the uh, Climate Action Council. So this is what we are trying to do. And if you look at it, some of those are incredibly difficult. Just look at the very last one. You know, 185 trillion BDUs that we are going to eliminate. Think about that in terms of light bulbs. You know, we're talking about, I don't know, 43 billion 100 watt light bulbs that we would need to replace. That's the amount of energy that we want to save in the state. It's kind of crazy. But then, this is Itaca. It's slightly simpler than the rest of the state. Our economy is not so complex. So we can think about it in a different way. We can think about it in, in terms of where the emissions come from, you know? So we did some modeling, but because here's the thing, and I need to be honest with you. Normally, the way you do this is, is you do a greenhouse gas inventory, and there are a number of organizations that have defined the right protocols, so you can do a greenhouse gas inventory and do it right. We just don't have time for that. It takes like two years to do it properly. So we decided to do mathematical modeling. So we took information that we had from the county, from the city, Stanford University, Princeton University, and we ended up putting together a model that tells us that we have approximately 400,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. It's like 86,000 cars going at it right now. Imagine that, you know, you open your door and 86,000 cars 
you know, on outside your house. That's more or less the emissions that we have in Ithaca. But then we need to look at, you know, where the emissions come from. And the emissions come from buildings, you know. 40% of the emissions actually come from buildings. And out of those, about 80% come from space heating. So what we can see is energy use inside buildings, particularly to heat space in a city like Ithaca where with the weather we have, you know, that's where most of the energy goes. So if we were to tackle that, we would be tackling, you know, a chunk of the emissions that we have. About 40% of the emissions also come from transportation. And if you think about it, some of them, most of them come from single passenger vehicles. Some of them come from transit. Some of them come from off-road vehicles. But the reality is that most of them come from single passenger vehicles. Then there is the grid. And, you know, a lot of the fight and a lot of the activism goes there. And it's important because it's a huge amount of emissions. But it's slightly different for us because right now we're looking at Ithaca. This is the experiment. This is the pilot project for the entire country. So what we have here is, uh, you know, a transmission line that connects directly to a nuclear plant, to a hydropower facility. We have a ton of wind. So the reality is about 80% is highly likely to be carbon-free electricity. And I need to say that because I cannot categorically tell you that 80% of the, of the electricity is carbon-free. But you know, there is a high likelihood if you understand energy systems, you know, and I believe that that's the case. So in terms of emissions for the city, the grid, the electric grid, you know, it only accounts for about 15%. And then we have waste and other uses, but you know, that's just 5%. The problem we have, and I started by saying this, right? Because when you start trying to convince legislators, when you start trying to convince people that you actually need to address this, you need to explain it to them in a way that they can also explain to their constituents. So you cannot have a very complicated project that is the Ithaca Green New Deal, and not everybody talks in terms of elevating social capital, re redefining the, the social contract. You need to talk about it in terms of, of, of things that people understand. So what are you gonna do? And the answer is, well, energy efficiency, decarbonization, and electrification. What if we go with those things? And I can explain those three very well. And that's the way we presented this to the city council, so they could approve that you know, this is what we have to do. So that's the strategy. And if you remember at the beginning, I mentioned we're going to try to eliminate at least 80% of the carbon emissions. And that is because if you think about it, in the entire planet, the energy stock can only be electrified by about 85%. Sorry, by, by 65%. Most of what we have because of the energy density and the energy flow requirements cannot be electrified. So what we need to do is to switch to low carbon fuels. We need to look into hydrogen. We need to look into other alternatives. In the city of Ithaca, it is about 85% that we can electrify, which means that you know, we can go for it. But there is 15% that we still need to figure out. And for that, we're going to look at low carbon fuels like hydrogen. And I'll tell you about a project that we have right now with hydrogen. Uh, we're going to be looking at carbon capture and carbon sequestration. Uh, so, this is what we have, 400,000 metric tons of CO2, and if we were to implement energy efficiency across the board in every aspect of the economy, we would reduce about 30% of the emissions. And when we talk about energy efficiency, yeah, when we talk about buildings, we talk about thermal efficiency, but when we talk about, you know, the way you live your life, for example, just think about it. Every time you open the tap, you know, there is a pump pushing water to your house, and every time you flush the toilet, there is a pump taking water away from your house. All that consumes energy. So being more efficient means changing the way you look at your life in general. But also, we can, you know, we can start electrifying everything that we can electrify, and we can reduce 30% more of emissions. So if we were to electrify space heating systems, if we were to electrify vehicles, you know, we will take away 30% of the emissions. And actually, if we were to decarbonize the electric grid, and what does that mean? I mean, if you know, like how it works, you understand that the utility company, actually not even the utility company, it is at the end the public service commission that decides how and you know, the electricity is produced in this state. So it's not for us to decide. So how do we decarbonize the grid? Well, actually we replace the 20% of electricity that we don't have as carbon-free electricity with solar. And we add energy storage. And we figure out how to introduce more renewable energy. And I'll tell you how we fix that. And then, you know, at the end, we're going to have to add carbon sequestration. And we're going to work on that, and eventually we will. And, well, I'll tell you right now, because I don't know if I have the slides for that later. But one example of something that we're doing, and this is super cool, because 
we have a, a wastewater treatment plant. I don't know if you know how, how this works, but you know, the city of Ithaca, the town of Ithaca, and the town of Dryden, we all share a wastewater treatment plant. So every time you flush the toilet, it all goes to the same place. Once it goes there, you know, it actually goes, you know, all the, uh, all the organic waste goes into a biodigester, which, you know, creates biogas that we use to produce electricity, and then we treat the water, and the biosolids are taken to the landfill. And it's a funny thing because for many years we've been taking this to the landfill. We are taking all these methane emissions away from the city, and for a really long time we were very happy to say, it's not in the city, I'm not polluting, it's in some landfill up north. But now we decided to do something about it, and we started looking, okay, what if we were to take that? You know, after the biodigester, we take the sludge, we actually put it in a pyrolysis system. That is, what if we burn the hell out of this thing at a very high temperature in the absence of oxygen, and we actually sequester carbon that way, and we produce biochar, which is awesome for composting. So we could do that, or we could probably take advantage of a biomass gasification system that will have hydrogen as a byproduct. And that's the way our waste to hydrogen project emerged in the city of Ithaca. And have you seen the electric buses from TCAT? Well, there is a company that came from Cornell, it's called Standard Hydrogen, and what they do is they use hydrogen to power electric charging stations. So we are beginning to develop a project with them where we have ways to hydrogen to charge in the stations to charge the electric buses from Tika. Literally every time you flush the toilet, you are charging a vehicle in the city. That's gonna be so cool when we have it going. Talk, 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 <laughs> one, thank you. So here's what we're talking about. You know, when I say 30% electrification, sorry, 30%, what is that one, efficiency? This is what I'm talking about. You know, when we talk about houses, it's about thermal efficiency. And, and we'll get into the details of that in a second. But when we talk about uh, waste, for example, we're talking about circular economy. We're not talking about waste anymore. We're talking about materials management. We're talking about looking at things differently. The kind of things that we can do is to address, for example, source reduction. Because, you know, the fact that we figure out how to recycle everything doesn't mean that we should continue producing at the same level. It shouldn't be, for example, here in architecture, we could talk about you know, deconstruction. We could talk about how not to produce waste. And that's what we mean with circular economy. Then we have, what else we have? Okay, then we have transit. You know, when we talk about energy efficiency, we can talk about reducing the number of miles that people travel on a single passenger vehicle. And if we were to do that, then that, that means we need to convince people to ride a bike or to go on, on transit. And maybe what we need to do is to make transit free for everybody. You know, TCAT made an announcement that it's gonna be free for people under 18 very soon. But what if we were to make it absolutely free for everybody? And what if we were to make it electric? That would be awesome, right? So we're working on that right now. But we're also working on bike share uh, and, and, and different models. So that's what we mean with energy efficiency. And when we, oh, when we talk about electrification, this is what we mean. We actually mean, what if we were to take you know, space heating systems and we were to replace them with heat pumps? Normally, when we use natural gas for a centralized furnace, normally it's about 30% efficient. That is 70% primary energy waste. And when you have a heat pump, they are 300% efficient. I know it's crazy to think that anything could be more than 100% efficient, but you know, the way we measure things, you can go from 30% to 300%. So that's what we're trying to do when we say that we're electrifying space heating systems because what we wanna do is eliminate energy waste, but we also wanna increase efficiency beyond 100% using heat pumps. And the same thing goes for water heaters because we can change the way we heat our water and, and we can use heat pumps. We can use heat pumps also for drying your clothes. And, and, and you know, it gets really interesting because you can imagine, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning, when you look at things from the electrical panel perspective, you know that if we were to electrify everything in your home, it's gonna use a lot of electricity. It's gonna be very complicated, right? So we're gonna have to make some fundamental changes in the building. Those changes that we need for, a, for an electric clothes dryer are the same changes that you need for a charging station. So why don't we take advantage of, it, of these economic benefits of co-deploying some technologies, and if we're gonna install a, a, an electric dryer, we, why don't we install a, 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 an EV charging uh, station? 
And then we're looking at the way we cook. I don't know if anybody saw this, this report from Stanford University that talks about you know, methane leaks at home. And we know that the air quality in any home that has a natural gas or propane uh, stove, uh, it's three times beyond you know, what it should be for people to live there. So it is very interesting because we have never really addressed that. So we, are, we actually hired this chef who is this dude, you know, he knows so much about cooking with induction range. And, and it's just so fascinating to talk to them. But, you know, by talking to this guy, by talking to chefs that actually do this for a living, we realized that it would be better. You know, I, it is actually equivalent. You know, when we switch from natural gas stoves to electric stoves, it's the same thing as when we switch from analog to digital music. You know, there is much more control in terms of what we can do with that. It's difficult for some chefs because they're more traditional, and a lot of them are opposed to this change, but the city is trying to push them to think about it differently. But now, when we talk about, when we talk about these economic benefits of co-deployment, we can talk about EV charging stations, we can talk about solar at the same time. There are economic benefits of co-deploying solar technology with heat pumps and with charging stations. And we achieve economies of scale in a single building, but we achieve also economies of scale at doing 6,000 buildings in the city at the same time. And then we're talking about energy storage because you know, if we are gonna try to go like really 24 hours a day, seven days a week, carbon-free electricity, we need to have a way of storing electricity so we can use it at night and still claim that we're using carbon-free electricity at all times. So we're gonna introduce a storage. Actually, right now we have a project that is gonna bring KiCAS, you know, utility scale, energy storage systems to the city. We're also looking into the hydrogen project that I told you for TCAT, but we are looking at, you know, every single opportunity to reduce carbon emissions from everything that you see in there. And then, yeah, obviously it gets complicated, so we're gonna, the, the next one, please. Thanks. Uh, so we need to look at, you know, carbon capture. We need to look at this. We need to look at, you know, direct air carbon capture. We need to look at, you know, natural things to sequester carbon. But, you know, this is something that we're gonna take on in a few years. Right now, we have the hydrogen project. We have waste to hydrogen. That's gonna produce low carbon, actually carbon neutral hydrogen. And we're gonna be able to sequester some carbon with the biochar. So, you know, we're on our way. But then it gets interesting because we started talking about people. We started talking about how we're doing this for people, and that's the reason we're doing this. And here comes the issue of climate justice. And I don't know if you heard this term before. A lot of people haven't, and you should have. But anyway, here it is. Climate justice really means the intersection of social justice and environmental justice. It's when we stop thinking about people just in terms of their proximity to a landfill or to the highway. We start thinking about people also because of who they are. Because if you think about it, you know, climate change has historically affected minority groups, disadvantaged communities, in a disproportionate way compared to the rest of the population. And that historical inequity, you know, it's something that we can address here. This is something that we can change. But now with COVID, circumstances change for a lot of people. So now, when we talk about environmental justice, when we talk about climate justice, we need to identify who are those who will not benefit from this transition as much as everybody else? Who are those who have been affected by climate change more than us? And who are those that because of their current condition are more likely to be affected in the future? And if we identify those groups, those vulnerable groups that don't necessarily coincide with the skin color because we tend to think in those terms. We tend to think that because you're black, because you're brown, because you come from a, an ethnic minority, you should be considered a climate justice community. And that might be true. But it is also true that a lot of people live under the line of poverty, that a lot of people live in isolation, that a lot of people have mental problems, that a lot of people independent of ethnicity suffer from this. So when we think about climate justice, we need to start thinking about it in a more holistic and comprehensive way. We also need to have a climate action plan, and that's what we're working on right now. We have a baseline, we have an understanding of what we need to do, but we need to work on this climate action plan so we can make progress, and we also, need to engage the community in a very different way. When we talk about democratic engagement, we're not talking about consultation. We're talking about doing things differently. And if you are nerds, let me tell you how we're doing this, because I think it's pretty awesome. We have a program, I don't know if you have heard, called 1,000 Conversations with the Community. 
And the idea is to establish 1,000 conversations with the community. And the idea is this. I talk to you right now, and you know, we're recording this. We can upload it to a website. And the last thing I tell you is go home and talk to people about this, and then ask them to talk to people about this. And if you want and if you can, record that conversation and upload it to the same website. And now imagine what's happened. We're talking to somebody, and we're talking about, you know, what do you care? And they tell me, well, I care that I don't get access to vaccines. And then I talk to somebody else, and they tell me, well, I care that I don't get access to education. And then I talk to somebody, and they tell me, I care that I haven't had a job in the last three years. But then you start thinking about those three problems may seem different, but when you put them, you know, try to identify the nexus, you know, that that actually brings everything together, you may think that racism, for example, <laughs> could be at the center of everything. So the next stage of the 1,000 conversations is bringing the nexus back to the community and talking about things that are very difficult to talk about. But if we talk about them, then we can turn them into policies, policies to address those issues. But we are engaging the community to a point where the community can come, come and be part of the solution, part of the implementation, part of the financing of the solution. So the way of democratic engagement for the ITECA Green New Deal is through having conversations, identifying the nexus, and eventually leading towards a democratic participation in budgeting. Imagine that you could decide how the city uses 10% of the budget. And that is something that we want to do. It's something really hard to do, but we, we were trying. Then, this way. Workforce development. When we talk about climate change, we talk about climate justice, we need to talk about jobs. We need to talk about how people need you know, to find a way of participating in the green economy. And this is hard because things are changing. And, and you know, it's, it's not somebody's fault that they work in the fossil fuel industry. And we want the fossil fuel industry to go away. Well, we need to find a job for, the, for them because you know, they have families too. They pay a mortgage too. So, Workforce development took a different light, and, and here is the very interesting part. In the city of Ithaca, with everything that we're doing, we believe that we're going to create 3,000 job opportunities. Think about it. We're 30,000 people living in this city. 3,000 jobs. We don't have them here. We don't have people living in the city that can take on those jobs. Suddenly, this became an issue of economic development, but also climate justice, an issue of workforce development, and suddenly, we need to establish partnerships that go beyond the city. I'll tell you more about it in a second. Uh, and then there is what happens to the infrastructure. I don't know if you, you, if you are familiar with this, but you know, we, we talk about the overall load, the electric load in the city. And normally, it tends to be during summer when we use the most electricity because of air conditioning. But you know, if we were to electrify heating systems, then it would be during winter. But you know what the problem is? That during winter, if the city was fully electrified, during winter we would use three times the amount of electricity that we use during the summer. And the problem is that you know, the transformers, the cables, the utility poles, all that has been designed for much less than that. So now it turns out that if we want to achieve the dream of fighting climate change by eliminating fossil fuels and electrifying the city, we need to invest like $200 million in the infrastructure for the city. You see the problem, right? So what that means is we need to be more efficient. We need to reduce the amount of electricity that we use. We need to change the patterns of use. And there are so many things that we need to do. And I'll get to that in a second. One more, please. <laughs> One more, OK. So there are different ways in which we can do this. We can do nothing, you know, and that's business as usual. One more. Or we can actually let the momentum that we have right now, you know, carry us, you know, still for longer, and we'll achieve 25% of our goals. And you know, it's true. There's people with electric cars. There's people who are, you know, already uh, working on their homes, electrifying their homes. Or the city could put its weight behind and you know try to see if we can probably, I don't know, 75% of the buildings can be retrofitted and electrified. 75% of the cars could be electrified. Or what if we were to really put the weight of the community and the government behind this project and try to achieve 80% at least of emissions reduction? What if we were to do that? And what that means is all of that on the screen. But if we want to go for the whole enchilada, we need to do everything, leaf blowers, you know, uh, snow plowers. We need to change everything and turn them into either electric or low carbon. And it costs a ton of money. It costs about $2 billion to do that. So then it becomes an issue of financial engineering. See how this gets complicated? It's all about energy. It's all about people. It's all about emissions. It's all about money. It's all about so many things. But that's you know, why it's fun.
<laughs> I think. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna take you through this one very quickly uh, because I, I'm already behind, I suppose, I don't know. No, I'm okay. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm gonna take you through what we have been doing in the past year because it's kind of fun to tell the story. I joined the city of Ithaca exactly a year ago and in one year we have made so much progress. So it all started with, okay, start with that. I came here, that was cool. Uh, then we try to redefine the Ithaca Green New Deal. We figure out, you know, if we can do it differently. We can make it more about the people. Then, uh, crap, I can see. Yeah, then we, we started defining, you know, the different elements. And one of them was a very strict energy code. You know, what we did in the city, and, and this was done before I came, actually. So the city passed a very strict uh, energy code supplement that mandates, you know, that starting in 2026, buildings will no longer be able to use natural gas. We ban natural gas starting 2026. And this is a funny story, actually. In December, New York City announced exactly the same thing. And we were happy to say, yeah, we did it six months ago. That was fun. Then, then it goes away. Uh, then something happened in June. You know, when I came, I told the mayor, I remember having this conversation with him. And I said, dude, if you are really committed to do this, we should just go to the highest level and commit to this. Let me make a couple of phone calls and see if, if the city of Ithaca can ratify the Paris Agreement. It turns out that we could, so we went to the United Nations. And June 24th last year, the mayor presented before the United Nations the city's commitment to fight climate change. The Ithaca Green New Deal made it all the way there. And for a while, you could find in the website of the UN, the city of Ithaca is the only city, together with other countries, you know, fighting for the Paris Agreement. That was one of the best moments that we had. And then what happened was, because of that, it opened the door to talk to investors. We started talking to people with money, and we were able to raised about $100 million very quickly. You know, it was a matter of, of weeks that the city managed to raise $100 million to tackle climate change. And it's just the beginning. You know, I mentioned we need $2 billion. Right now, I can say that we're around $400 million. So, but, but we're moving really fast. I mean, we're, we're raising the money that we need to, to make this happen. And then, click. And then we had this idea. What if we were to electrify every single building in the city? We did, you know, the modeling. We saw, God, this is going to be hard. But, you know, let's ask the private sector. People know how to do this. So we issued an RFP. And then, you know, while we were working on the RFP, we started working, okay, we need to bring renewable energy. So we started thinking community choice aggregation, which you don't know about it. Look it up. It's not much fun. But, you know, we're, we're working on that too. And then, you know, in October, we started working on, on a solar farm. You know, we, are, we want to build a solar farm. You know, where Lowe's and Wegmans is, you know, behind that. There is a place people call the jungle. North of that, you know, we want to build a six megawatt solar farm. And we started the process to do that. And then came November, which is when the farm began. You know, in November, we announced that the city was going to be fully electric. You know, we're going to do it. And then the world went absolutely crazy. And, you know, bizarre things have happened in my life. But I got a phone call the following day from the White House. I mean, well done. I was like, that's cool. <laughs> and then. You know, like two days later, it was the Secretary of Energy and then the governor. And suddenly, people started paying attention. And, and it was just so incredible to see how, how people were seeing, you know, like a little city like Ithaca could actually be a blueprint for decarbonization for cities in the United States. This is kind of cool, right? Then we came to this year, and we started by, we partnered with the, with the White House. It's weird to say. It. We partnered with the White House to create a building performance standard coalition because we want the world, the city, uh, obviously, then the state and then the country to have a standard for decarbonization of existing buildings. So we're working with them on that. And we joined the United Nations 24-7 Carbon Free Electricity Energy Compact. And what that means is that the city is committing to do for the entire city 24 hours a day, seven days a week, carbon free electricity, eliminating any trace of fossil fuels in our electricity. That is probably the hardest commitment that we have made. But we're getting help. You know, we're partnering with Google. We're partnering with Kite. We're a number of organizations that are actually doing this already, but at the corporate level. So it's kind of complicated to think about a city, but we're working on that. We are also, we did something really cool. And, and I don't know if you enjoy this as much as I do. Uh, some have left, so I guess not so much. But anyway, the, we, we, I mentioned that we're going to create 3,000 jobs. And you know, one thing is, 
cool, we're going to create 3,000 jobs. And the other one is, oh, crap, we need 3,000 people to do what we need to do here. So what we did was, in December, you know, a couple of us got on a car and we drove all the way to Elmira, you know, the city of Elmira. Then we drove to Binanton, we drove to Syracuse, we drove to Rochester. And we talked to the majors in each one of these cities. And the proposal was very simple, was, look, you have a ton of unemployed people. In Elmira, they have a very large population of either formerly incarcerated or families of people currently incarcerated that need jobs. Then we went to Rochester, and the unemployment in the black community is huge. Then we went to Syracuse, and similarly, it was the black community and the brown community with high levels of unemployment. Ithaca has a very large number of minorities that are unemployed. And then we went to Binanton, and there is a large number of people living under the line of poverty. And then suddenly the proposal was, Ithaca has a market. Why don't we share the cost of transportation, childcare, language support, coaching? And then we bring people to the city of Ithaca, and they participate in a program of apprenticeship. And we can actually pay them to learn how to electrify a building. And eventually they can go back to their own cities and start a workforce development there. So we created something called the Green Jobs Corridor. And the Green Jobs Corridor now serves 2.7 million New Yorkers. And it all started here in Ithaca. And what we have, what we did in February, was to write to the federal government and tell them, we need $25 million to make this happen. If not, you know, we'll figure it out, but it would be cool if you help. The strategy a lot of the time is to embarrass the hell out of everybody into giving us money. <laughs> Sometimes it works. And one of the things I mentioned earlier is that we need like $200 million to change the infrastructure outside. Well, we were negotiating with the utility company like every day and every night. You know, these guys would not take my calls anymore. I was camping outside their houses. But eventually, we convinced the utility company to put in $100 million towards fixing the infrastructure in the city. I kid you not. Right now, it's before the Public Service Commission for approval. But we got $100 million directed to the city of Ithaca so we can do electrification. All the pieces are coming together in a wonderful way. Then, you know, the city was uh, finally recognized as partner with the APA as, as, as a green power partner. We were selected by Bank of America as, uh, you know, to certify the city as, as lead. We're hoping to be a gold city. Um, we are also, okay. And we're also working on climate justice. Right now, like two days ago, we presented before the city council a new definition of climate justice communities. This is important because what we need to do is to change the government, the way the government operates. We need to change the way the government defines programs to help people. So we need to identify who are we helping. And there is a definition from the federal government of climate justice. I don't know if you know anything about this, but Biden, during campaign, he was talking about Justice 40. And what that means is we're going to redirect 40% of the benefits of the fight against climate change to climate justice communities. And that sounded awesome. But nobody knew what the hell he meant by climate justice communities or by benefits. Then they got around to defining that. And then the proper definition from the federal government of a climate justice community doesn't talk about race. They forgot that little detail there. And they didn't do it because they believed that the Supreme Court could shut it down. You know, somebody could sue because you are selecting one over the other, etc. So then it came to the states. And the state of New York came up, like, I don't know, two months ago with a climate justice community definition. And the definition is entirely centered around New York City. And then you go, like, what about upstate New York, man? I mean, seriously, what about the rest of us? You know, I know the state is divided. Half people live in New York City and they're half live somewhere else. But you know, we count. So we decided, OK, we're going to take it on our own hands, and we're going to define our own climate justice community definition. And we did. So we're going to be the first city with a climate justice community definition of our own. And we're going to have those who worry about electric vehicles and want to have more charging stations. We're going to have an RFP uh, soon. And the idea is to deploy 500 charging stations in the city. We're also going to electrify the police department, the fire department, the Department of Public Works, and the process begins in June with an RFP. We're also going to be uh, Im implementing our program uh, to produce biochar so we can eventually uh, work with hydrogen. And there is this wonderful building in downtown. It's the Henry St. John building. I don't know if you have seen it. We're actually turning that 110-year-old building into a fully electrified and the most advanced building in the entire city. And you know the coolest thing about it is that it's affordable housing. That is, people living there are officially under the line of poverty, most of them. So what that means is we're starting where we need to start. You know, the first building that is going to be officially electrified and is going to have 
grid interaction is going to be this. It's going to have solar panels. It's going to have a way of distributing solar energy among each one of the units in the building. It's going to have energy storage. It's going to have charging stations. It's going to have the latest in uh, heat pump technology. And heat pumps are going to be talking to each other. We're going to have a way of monitoring energy performance and energy profiles. It's going to be the most advanced building. And it's an affordable house building. That's why we do these things, right? And then the hydrogen project. I am very hopeful that by October, you know where Chainworks is by any chance? Chainworks, you know, when you go to Trader Joe's, you look up the hill, and there is this white building that looks scary. <laughs> that is Chainworks. And it's 1.2 million square feet that are to be developed. We're already trying to get a piece of that to put our hydrogen power EV charging stations. So it is all going to be fun. I promise you that. I'm going to skip this because I'm already behind. But uh, I'm going to get to the fun part in a second. OK, here. This is all we're doing right now in the city of Ithaca. And when people tell you the city of Ithaca is really moving ahead and it's really ahead of a lot of other cities and other states, it's because of this. This is, this is what we're doing. And it's, it's kind of complicated. It's kind of difficult. And sometimes I fucking hate it. But you know, it is, it is the kind of stuff that you want to do if you are in sustainability, if you are in urban development. This is the kind of stuff that you really want to do. What you see on the top are those foundational elements of the Ithaca Green New Deal. It's all about people on the top. And if you think about it, uh, below it is all about you know, infrastructure. So that's what we're trying to do right now. And you know, some of the most important ones are these ones, because we're talking about the electrification of homes, the electrification of every single building, and we're talking about the electrification of transportation. That's one. And then the other one is, is this. You know, we're talking about climate justice, democratic engagement, workforce development. Those are the key elements that we're doing here. So very quickly, I want to tell you about, what is this? Justice 50. So I mentioned the federal government had Justice 40, which is 40% of the benefits. And then the state was 35 to 45% of the benefits. And then the city were like, yeah, you know what? You didn't take into account home ownership. And if you think about it, home ownership is an issue of climate justice. Because what's happening is that people in coastal communities are moving to nice places like Ithaca. They are bringing up the price of housing in the city. And they are gentrifying the hell out of people out of the city. And then you have people living in homes that are not up to code, but that's all they can afford. And then with the extreme weather that we have, suddenly home ownership became an issue of climate justice. So we told the government at the state level, like, dude, you missed that. And they were like, well, it's your problem. So we're adding it to our own definition. And then we did the numbers. And I think it's cool to say 40% because it sounds like a lot. But when you think about what would you actually need to do, you know, we're thinking about the city of Ithaca. And you have about 25% of people that qualify as a climate justice community. But we need twice the money to help them than we need for the 75% remaining of the city. What that means is at least 50% of the money needs to go and help climate justice communities in the city of Ithaca. This is the Green Jobs Corridor that I was talking about. You know, this is what we did. We put together these cities, and we are creating a unified workforce program so we can have people participating in this. And we are reaching out to all the black, brown, Muslim, South Asian, formerly incarcerated communities. We are reaching out to people. And this is important, because this, this remained really separate from all of these groups, because we, we didn't have a demographic classification for them. You know, people from violent backgrounds and undocumented workers. So right now, with the Green Jobs Corridor, we're actually doing that. You know, when, when you think about people who have come here from Syria, from El Salvador, from different places, this is the type of violence that we're talking about, people that have fled their own countries. And when they come here, when they talk about conflict resolution, it's something very different. So we're actually, in the Green Jobs Corridor, one of the key wraparound services, apart from childcare and transportation, is coaching for conflict resolution for people with violent backgrounds. So we're actually trying to do the right thing. And it's, God, it's so hard, but it's so much fun at times. So right now, this is the focus of the city. We're trying to do this. OK, this is going to go fast. One more. OK, good. This is specifically for buildings. This is what we're trying to do. So we have an energy code that addresses the design in buildings. We need to make sure that buildings are designed not to use fossil fuels. Then we have the electrification program that is trying to electrify every building that already exists and has a certificate of occupancy. So we can actually turn them into you know, 
carbon neutral buildings. And then we're going to have a new benchmark law that we expect to have this year. And what that means is we're going to have a law where buildings that are 15,000 feet or over, they're going to have to report energy consumption and water consumption, and we're going to eventually have a cap, and that cap is going to be less and less, and eventually people are going to be forced to move in that direction. We're also going to have uh, our building performance standard, which is what we're developing the, with the White House Coalition, and we're trying to define a standard, basically inviting people to move away from fossil fuels in a phased approach. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm going to skip this one. Oh, thank you. I don't know where I'm at. Okay, yeah. There, there are so many issues with this thing. You know, everything that we're trying to do has to do with, with, with money. It has to do with infrastructure. So, you know, I mentioned most of them, but just the first one, just thinking about it. And we were having this conversation uh, uh, earlier on today, actually. We're talking about how much does it cost? You know, I, I own a home, and I want to do this. I want to do the right thing. I want to retrofit and electrify. How much will it cost? Well, maybe $40,000. That is a ton of money for anybody. So we're looking at different ways of doing this. We're talking to mortgage companies, and we're saying, like, what if you were to give either a discount or you were able to give more money for people that want to do retrofit upon sale or electrification upon refinancing their mortgage? So they're coming around to do that. And then we went to the state government and we told them, what if instead of giving, you know, a number of uh, incentives, you were to consolidate all of those incentives and you allow us to use that money to buy down the interest, the cost of capital from private money, even commercial banks, and we use that money to help people. And then what if we were to create a program that is 6,000 buildings instead of just one building? What if we were to you know, make sure that the industry is consolidated and we have a standard way of doing things? When we did the numbers, we realized that we could just bring down, just by having the economies of scale, we could bring down 30% the cost of a project. And then, by doing it all together, we have bulk purchasing power, and we negotiated with companies like Mitsubishi that we could have a 25 to 30% reduction in cost in a lot of the equipment. Then we started talking to the federal government and the state government, and we realized that 30% of the cost could be covered by state and federal dollars. And then suddenly, something that could cost $40,000 comes down to $15,000. And then we started thinking, what if we were to create a program where people can pay in 15 years, you know, $1,000 per year? Then you divide it by month. You can actually pay from the savings that you're going to create by doing this. So suddenly we have a way of paying for this. So it became uh, a way of dealing with the first problem. And then I'm going to skip this. OK. I mentioned that things went just freaking crazy the moment we announced this. You know, It was so much fun to see on Qatar television that they were talking about Ithaca. And the way they were describing Ithaca and the work that we were doing here, I didn't understand anything, but I almost cried anyway. Because it was you know, one of those moments that you want to see your work. You, know, you want to see your work having an impact and changing things and changing lives and making it as far as possible. We were invited to give a talk in Japan and in Israel because the governments were assessing taking on the Ithaca model to implement decarbonization at the city level. I mean, this is, this is kind of the stuff, right? This is what we want to do. Uh, yep, yeah. one more. There you go. So, there, thank you. So, what the city is doing is partnering with a number of companies. We're partnering with a company called Block Power. That is, you know, we ask them, can you manage this complexity? Can you help us with financing? Can you help us with operations? Can you help us with incentives, with negotiating with the federal government? And they say yes, who knows why, but they did. So now we have Block Power and a company called Alturos. Alturos is an impact investor. And they're willing to put into the city you know, as much as $500 million if we do things right. So this is kind of cool. Suddenly, people want to put the money where the money should go. Not fossil fuels, but here. And just a funny thing, there are two companies in the world that do the same, called Alturos. One of them invests in fossil fuels, and the other one invests in this. It's kind of funny, you know, the same name. Um, the next one, please. OK, this one is tricky, but. I want to tell you how we are actually trying to do this in the most efficient possible way. When you think about how do you convince everybody to go in this direction? You know, everybody has different political affiliations. Everybody thinks differently about the problem. And everybody knows better than me, apparently, because every time somebody tells me how to do my job. But 
you know, at the end of the day, we need to think about it in, in a way that would make the most efficient use of our resources. And you need to think about it in the same way you think about the diffusion of technology. You need to think about it in terms of early adopters, in terms of laggards, right? So we started thinking, okay, what is the equivalent? And we think, okay, you know what? There is about 30% of people that live in the city of Ithaca that actually fall on the other side of the political spectrum that don't believe in climate change, and they have told me, I will never do this. I actually lost a friend to this. You know, a friend told me, I hate you because you are promoting this crap, and we're no longer friends. But, you know, now I understand that this, you know, the political affiliation at times could be even more powerful than the need to do the right thing. So I know there is, in this case, about 30 to 35% of people that will not do this, so we're not bothering at all. We are ignoring them entirely. Then there is a group that are the early adopters, that are the Tesla owners, people who are already doing this. Well, we don't have to do much with them because they're already doing it. So that basically takes care of half of the population in the city. So now we have to deal with really this part. We have to deal with 50%. And when you think about it, of that 50%, actually half of them are low income. And for low income people, we got some incentives from the government that actually makes the whole project free for them, making a very compelling case for people. And the building owners are gonna get tax abatements, they're gonna get a series of incentives so they can actually participate in this program. So that leaves me with 25 to 30% of the population. And what that means is, why just targeting those? Why just targeting 25 to 30% of the population that we need to bring to the green side of the force? That's it. But that makes it really efficient, because we know who we have to target. It turns out that it's people normally very close to the median income. It's people with a job. We, we can understand who they are. So that makes our program much more efficient. And this, Felix, is Timur here, by the way? No, just you? OK. He's helping with this thing. One of the things that we need to recognize is that it's impossible for us to do this on our own, you know, as government, as community. And we have Cornell University here. And, and, and you know, it's mind boggling why not everybody in City Hall is not working with Cornell right now. Because what they have is the ability to do things like this, you know, to develop a model when we can identify the energy profile of every single building in the city. And based on that, we can identify the potential energy savings that we could have if we were to retrofit and electrify. So we are working you know, very closely with Cornell University, with Felix and Timur and other people, trying to find the better way of doing this in the most efficient possible way. The, okay, I'm gonna go with all of them very quickly. Can you help me to get to 10? Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go very quickly over this. It's, it's, otherwise it'll be just too boring, but you know, one of the problems that we have here, the first one is what? Economic sophistication, yeah. The problem we have here is that there are not that many options. You know, if you want to electrify your home, you want to use heat pumps uh, a year ago or two years ago, you would have one manufacturer. That would be your only option. And you would have one contractor that works with them. And in reality, they would control the price. We don't have enough economic sophistication in the market. And if we had it, then we would be able to offer better options. So what we did when we made this announcement, we, we, we had a bunch of companies you know, coming down on Ithaca, and now there is at least 10 different brands of heat pumps that you could acquire, basically bringing the price down. So that's the first thing that we needed to do. The second one was industry fragmentation. If you wanted to do this in your house about a year ago, you would have to hire about 10 different companies to do it. And you need to get like 20 different permits from the city to do it. And the problem is, it is all fragmented. The industry is very fragmented. That that prevents you from doing this efficiently from an economic point of view, but also you know, in execution. So we needed to create you know, a partnerships and consolidate the industry, and we managed to do that. You know, some companies that were working separately, now they're working together, and they're agreeing on a way of doing things, and the profit margins are being agreed upon. Too. Then we have economies of scale. We realized that if we were to do one building, it would be too expensive. 35 to 40 thousand dollars, but if we were to do 6,000 billions, if we were to create economies of scale, we would save a ton of money in technology, in equipment, in labor, in a number of things, and then suddenly this could work. So then we realized that's why it doesn't work because we need to do it for the entire city, and that's when the idea actually came. Like, let's go for the whole enchilada, otherwise it's not going to work. Then we have bulk purchasing power. Yeah. I mean, if we were to work together with all the contractors and if we were to centralize everything on a program manager, the program manager could represent the interest of the city. 
And that way we could have uh, bulk purchasing power and then we would get a reduction, you know, the whole thing went right here. We could get a reduction, you know, in terms of cost. Uh, God, I should know this by heart, but I don't remember what's next. But anyway, uh, apart from bulk purchasing power, we needed to work on workforce development, we needed to work on infrastructure, and we need to figure out how to use the money more efficiently. And I don't know if you, there is New York State, even more than California, gives a ton of money to the people. NYSERDA, which is the government agency that actually focuses on energy, gets a ton of money uh, that is not appropriable. I don't know if that is the right term, but you know, you know what appropriation means in terms of government? That means that they can take your budget away one day because they want to. Well, NYSERDA doesn't have that problem. Their money actually stays with them, no matter what the government says or what the government, once it's assigned, the money stays with them. And they are funding this whole thing. The problem is that to do it properly, they're trying to do it through nonprofit organizations that, you know, get money for the rent, for salaries, and eventually some of the money goes to somebody else. And what that means is that we have about 50% efficiency in the, the way we use incentives from the government. For every dollar the government actually puts towards climate change, if we are lucky, half of it makes it to the final destination. So we needed to consolidate those incentives, and we need to work with the state government to make sure that they use money more efficiently. And that's actually what we managed to do. And, and that is kind of the, the cool part of it all. So I'm just going to continue. I don't remember what's next, but I'll, I'll just, is it there? So you had economies of scale. Yeah. So one of the things that we did, and, and this is kind of the cool thing, you know, I mentioned this is going to cost $2 billion. And, and there is a ton of money that is coming from the state government, a ton of money that is coming from the federal government, but it's all you know, it's very, very inefficient. We're losing a ton of money in the process of getting money. So what we decided to do was to go to the private sector. And this is one of the coolest things. And I think the one thing that, that people are recognizing of the Ithaca model is that we are actually turning financial engineering into a central piece of everything that we want to do. So what we did was, okay, what if, like, if we were to do, to achieve economies of scale, we started doing the numbers and we figured we need at least a thousand buildings. And if anybody has been involved in any work at any home doing retrofitting, you would think that a thousand buildings is just completely crazy. And if we were adding numbers thinking, you know, let's say it's going to cost $50,000 in average for multifamily, single family, we needed half a million, uh, half a billion dollars, right? No, $50 million, sorry, yeah. So we started looking for $50 million, and then when we talked to the first you know, potential lender, they told us, well, you cannot mix residential and commercial because underwriting is very different. And we're like, holy crap, then we need to start looking at it differently. And then we started looking at commercial and industrial buildings, and we realized that to achieve economies of scale, we need about 600. So suddenly the program became 1,600 buildings. And that is the pilot program. So it's a huge pilot program. And then we start adding numbers and we realized that we need $100 million. So then we went out looking for that money. And when we did, that's when you know, the magic happened. And it was really weird because the first thing that we did was to talk to you know, a private equity investor and we told them, here's the thing. We need you to invest in the city of Ithaca. And they were like, yeah, I don't do that. Like, yeah, but here's the thing. We are the government and what we can do is to create a market for you. So you don't need to invest in the city of Ithaca, you need to invest in a company that could invest in the city of Ithaca. What if you were to invest in a company like Block Power, for example? What if you were to invest in a company like them and they were to take on the entire city to do energy efficiency retrofitting and thermal load electrification? So then you start thinking about how private equity makes its money and they make their money basically in returns from their investments. So if they were to invest in a company well, that's close to what I was saying. Uh, if you were to invest in a company, then you want that company to be successful. And here is the thing, and this is kind of the complicated part, but if we were to simplify it, it would be this. You have a company that invests in a company that is worth $20 million because it's new. And then you have somebody investing $100 million in that company. That means the company is worth $120 million, right? But then you have a company that's going to tackle a market that is worth a billion dollars then suddenly that company, by having exclusive access to that market, is worth $1 billion plus $120 million. So in the world of private equity, that means you invested very little in a company that gave you a huge return. 
So that's the way we started talking about this. We were like, what if we were to partner to develop a market in the city of Ithaca, and then we have private companies in which you can invest, and if you invest in those companies and take advantage of this market, just the cash flow alone is gonna make this company so valuable that you have a return on your investment immediately. And that was the pitch. That's really what we brought to private investors. And things evolve. Things evolve, and then we start talking about, oh, now we're here, thanks. <laughs> Actually, it's funny. We were talking about the last point, aggregation and securitization. That's where things get really interesting. And as any, I mean, raise your hand if you have any idea at all what I'm talking about with the 10 point, with the last one there. Great, thank you. Can you explain it to me? <laughs> no. Here's the thing, you know, we invest in, climate, in clean energy projects because we understand how they work. So we tend to invest in large scale solar projects, for example, right? We understand and we know how to manage risk and we know how to assess risk mostly. So there is a way of understanding, you know, what the project's gonna give you with what probability of success, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens with the small projects? What happens with the small scale projects? Like for example, a building that you want to electrify, that you want to retrofit, you know, can you invest in that? Where is the risk? Where is the return? Who can come in? It's too small for private equity. So suddenly we thought about what if we were to, the economies of scale, the 6,000 buildings can be thought of as the aggregation of multiple small scale high risk projects. And then we have the state government and the federal government providing great enhancements for half the people in the city, therefore minimizing risk. And it's a project backed by the government. And then suddenly we have a project that is the aggregation of multiple small scale high risk projects that the city is backing, that the government is in the state and the federal level are backing. And then if we have these projects, we can further securitize these projects. That is, we can probably sell to other investors. And if we sell to investors, that is the money that we actually use to pay for these retrofits. And then certainly through aggregation and securitization, that's the way we created this program. It might be too complicated, but it really isn't. It's just, it's too complicated to do one, it's, Difficult, but easier to understand from a financial point of view to do all of them. So we did that. Um, <laughs> I guess. Okay. Uh, can we go and probably skip this one so we can? All of us? Yeah, all of it. Okay. So I'm just going to take you, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to take you through this one just very quickly because the other one was, this is how we are trying to do, do this in the most efficient way. Here, what we're trying to show is what we had at the very beginning. We managed to negotiate private money coming in at a relatively low interest rate. You know, we were talking about probably 4%, so it wasn't too bad. But then, you know, we started thinking, okay, what we can do is probably manage risk at the, at the local level. What if we were, you know, if we were to change the way things are done normally. And we, instead of using government money, we actually use private money. And the government money comes down to actually lower the cost of capital. And what that means is, what if we were like, you have a, an investor that is willing to put $100 million in the city of Ithaca, and is expecting $10 million in return. So oversimplifying, but the way it could work is, you use the government money to put it in the same pool. So instead of having 100, now you have 105 million. But those five million that you just put in there already go to cover part of the return, part of the interest that they wanted. So suddenly you bought down the interest rates. So by doing that, you made money much cheaper because you managed to bring the money at a lower interest rate for people. So suddenly you are creating a very affordable financial product so you can do electrification. And then you start thinking about how you can use, you know, federal money, how you can use, you know, other incentives that come from the utility company. And then you realize that you can actually bring down the cost and bring down the risk of the entire project through aggregation to a point that you can offer, at times even, 0% interest in a financial product that will allow people of low income to participate in this. So what we're doing right now in the city is defining these priority areas. So we are beginning to work in areas like for example, priority area number one and number two is where we have the most low income people in the city. And we're starting right there. That's where we're going to work and where we're gonna do electrification. Then eventually we're gonna move on to the rest of the city. And the idea is to at some point have the entire city being fully electric. So the dream, click, click, one more. <laughs> okay, oh yeah. 
Well, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is, is something really complicated. It's something that is not that nobody thought about it before, but it really is something very difficult to achieve. And what you need is the government, the community, the state government, the federal government, and everybody supporting this effort. We are trying to electrify every building, every car. We're trying to redefine the concept of waste. We are trying to get hydrogen from actually you know, organic waste. We're trying to do things very differently. We're trying to have the most advanced, the most connected, and the most efficient city in the world. We're on our way. It's going to be really hard, and I hope that you know, if I were to talk to you in eight years, I'll tell you that at least we got 80% there. You know? But that's the dream. And I like this because you know, this is uh, graffiti from 1968 in Paris that says that to be realistic, you need to shoot for the impossible. And that's kind of what we're doing here. So thank you very much, guys. I am so glad you came to give a talk on Earth Day. I have never been so inspired and happy on an Earth Day, which really feels sometimes like a day of mourning. And I'm, I'm just thrilled by the energy and creativity that you have brought to our city and really hope to have our community learn and support you on this journey. So I think we're now moving to the Q&A portion, and I hope you guys have plenty of questions for Luis here. <laughs> or not. of Ithaca is part of what allows this to be successful and you know why did you decide to come to Ithaca instead of looking for a job in like New York City or DC or um, something like that and what is it about Ithaca that makes something like this possible? That's a tough question. Uh, so I, I'm going to start with the second one. Uh, I, I was talking to the, the chief of police, you know, he, his wife is a professor at Cornell and so is my wife. And he said that he was a prisoner of love and that's why he was in Ithaca instead of Atlanta where he's from. <laughs> so then I was thinking like, yeah, I kind of know what you're talking about. I, uh, so I, I, I came here because of COVID. I think, you know, my wife has been here, has been a professor at Cornell for 11 years and I have been traveling all this time. I would have spent like a month at home if I'm lucky. Uh, so with COVID, I changed my mind. I was like, no, I really want to be with family. I have two kids, and I've been traveling for most of their teenage years. So that's why, honestly. And, and then I didn't think that my skills would translate you know, from the federal level to, to the city level. They kind of do in a funny way, but you know, I wasn't expecting that. So I'm very lucky that the city was looking for this, and I'm very lucky that they agreed to interview me. Because if you look at my resume, it sucks. I mean, it wouldn't, they wouldn't have really even interviewed me. But they probably didn't have enough candidates, I don't know. But uh, the, the other one is, th there are so many ways of describing Ithaca. And one of them is you know, a very progressive city, you know, very young, probably the youngest in the state of New York, in average. Uh, we have you know, uh, the highest level of education also in the entire state. So you can describe it in those terms. And you may think that that is the reason. But I, I really think that's mostly correlation. The, but when you think about, for example, energy use, it is exactly the same. The energy profile of this city is the same as many other cities in America. You get up, you make breakfast, take a shower, go to work, go to school, come back home, do it again the next day. So the energy profile is very similar to many other places. And even though we have some policies, those policies, I could tell you that in the last 20 years, I don't think we had any policy that had truly influenced behavior in a way that could drive you know, change. So I think that made it unique. Uh, I think what enabled the pilot program, which is city level pilot program for the United States, was the size. You know, it's something that we can control. I was talking to you know, our colleagues in Los Angeles that are trying to implement a similar program. And they don't know how many buildings they have. They have no idea. I can tell you exactly how many buildings we have, but they don't know. And, and they were like, we don't even know where to get that information. Uh, and now you start from there, we have access to data and the data that we don't have is relatively easy and quick to gather. So I think that made it, it's not unique in the country, but we are the ones who are trying to do it. But you know, from those that could actually do it, we, we just decided to try. I think that's, that's my answer, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I was wondering about the politics of the city and whether the mayor had, you know. I know he's also um, sort of punching above his weight and is a very influential 
mayor on the nas national stage. And so I was wondering if there's something about the um, makeup of the city council and the leadership of the mayor that you know was unusually on board for something so innovative and ambitious. It was really hard to convince the city council to vote for this. It was like really, really hard. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Green New Deal is something that they did because of the momentum. And you know, the Sunrise Movement pretty much shamed the government into doing this. But there was no plan behind it. And, uh, and nobody did anything, really. So when we decided to finally do something about it, then people started realizing you know, what they committed to. And it was very difficult to have that conversation because at the local level, you know, the difference in when you define policy at the federal level is you, you define a policy and you don't see the impact for years. At the state level, it's less, but still, you, you know, it will take months before you see the actual impact. And here, you have a council meeting at 6 p.m. on Wednesday and Thursday somebody's calling you. And, and, and it's, it's very different. So the city council worries about that phone call the next day. So you need to work with them. You need to take them through everything. And they, at times, you know, they're behind the general concept, but they don't understand the implications. And when they do, sometimes they say, like, well, I don't think I can back you with this. So we did a lot of lobbying, a lot of lobbying. You know, the entire month of September and October, we were walking their dogs, cooking their meals, talking to them. And, and, but eventually, we, we convinced them. And, and the vote in November was 10 to 0 in favor. So that, that's what made it also special, I think. Hi, um, I'm Anna, thanks for your lecture. I have a quick question before I ask my real question. Um, have you heard of the Boysville Cottages at all? Yeah. In Brooklyn, okay, so I'm renting in the Boysville Cottages and it's been a really great experience. I've been in Ithaca for, I don't know, seven years. Um, and I think it's a really interesting housing typology because it encourages uh, each family that, that lives there to grow their own garden. There's compost. It's just a really great community. But I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how the Boysville Cottages might compare to the Eco Village and if there's sort of room for more experimentation and community based housing and how that might help with the city's goals. Yeah, Smurfville, they call it, right? Uh, I. I, I I like the cottages, they're nice. I like Eco Village too, I think it's nice. It's, it's just different. I think the, the main difference is in terms of governance, you know, how Eco Village is run and how the, the, the cottages are run. You know, those are, it's a community that works together, but you know, the decisions are pretty much individual. And in Eco Village, the decisions are community-wide. So it's a, it's a very different model. Uh, so in Eco Village, you know, it's the whole community that thinks that way, but also, you know, it's expensive, uh, Eco Village, compared to, to, to the cottages, for example. And, and it makes it hard for everybody. So there is an issue of equity in terms of, you know, when you think about uh, Eco Village, particularly with the cottages, it was a bit more affordable. And I think everything that, that he was promoting at the very beginning, it was, it was very interesting. Uh, and, and I think at the end of the day, it has to do with sustainability, but it's not a model that could scale for a whole city, especially, you know, the embedded infrastructure that you have in a city makes it impossible to adopt some of that. And also, because of health reasons, you cannot, I mean, there are stuff that he can do there that we cannot do here in the city. You know, there are zoning regulations that would ban half of what you guys do over there. So that's what makes it kind of complicated. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I do like the model. I think it's, it's kind of cool to have that, you know. I, I wanted to live there, but then my wife said that the houses were too close to each other, so we decided not to. <laughs> She's a professor, so she, she didn't want to meet students there. I think that's what she, she meant, yeah. Thank you for that very exciting presentation. Um, my question has more to, more to do with the details of your plan than the plan itself. When you talked about waste to hydrogen, um, I know that hydrogen contains less energy per unit volume than all other fuels. And it's interesting to see that a small town like Ithaca is considering that technology. Uh, I'm curious about whether you've done any calculations on how much waste is required to produce the hydrogen that you think and how many vehicles you think it's going to be able to power per day? We're actually not thinking at, you know, at least right now we're not looking at waste to hydrogen as, as the main source of hydrogen for the city because we don't think we're gonna uh, produce enough, you know, for, for what is needed. 
Uh, we are doing the modeling right now, the financial modeling, which you know requires to to really understand, you know, what is the potential for uh, hydrogen. It's 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 very clean hydrogen uh, coming out of the the gasification process. So the the real source of hydrogen are uh, electrolyzers uh, from standard hydrogen that we are hoping to power with wind energy. Uh, so right now we have, we're working with Invenergy that has this, uh, in Esteban County, they have a wind farm uh, and they have some excess capacity that you know, we can engage in with a PPA. And that is gonna be the main source. So we have done the calculations for what is needed for the pilot program for the first seven buses. And we'll see if it works and if the cost is actually, the cost structure is, is what we need. So right now it is more expensive than the alternative. But the problem that we have is that if you were to have the 50 buses, electric buses from TCAT charging from the grid, you know, it, it would be a nightmare. The city would catch fire quite literally. So we are trying to find alternative ways. So the premium that we're gonna pay is to compensate for, you know, the, the inefficient infrastructure that we have right now. So yeah, we have done the calculations for how much hydrogen, uh, and uh, I would disagree in terms of the, the, the energy density in, in hydrogen. I think it is, it is a reasonable source of energy, but you know, I, I would be interested in, in knowing why you are down on the hydrogen a little bit. I mean, once you, 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 you move past the, the blue hydrogen and gray hydrogen, and you think about green hydrogen or carbon neutral hydrogen, then, you know, I, I think it works, but... Uh, Absolutely, I'm not down on it, but I also know that the clothes and technology, the, the stack sizes right now, they're still trying to um, reduce it to fit vehicles and the oh. cost of it, like you said, is a lot more, not just for procurement, but also the operation of it over long periods of time would be much more expensive. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you cannot really transport hydrogen efficiently, so it has to be at the place. So, so and the electrochemical reaction in the fuel cells, that's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's efficient, but it's limited by its density, yeah. When I think of Ithaca, uh, the big blockchain stores on South Meadow Square kind of stick out as a sore thumb. So I was wondering, like, even just trans like getting commuting to and from those areas requires a, a good amount of energy usage. So I was wondering how that fits into your plan. And the second part of the question is, I was wondering how much power those entities like corporations and McGuire Kelly have in city government. Well, the... I mean, mining does take a lot of energy, and it has to do with, you know, uh, proof of work for the most part. You know, that's the really intensive part of it. And, you know, there is, a, a, you know, the proof of work, uh, proof of uh, stake, for example, that Solana is implementing that uses, you know, less than 10% of the energy that you use to mine Bitcoin. Uh, so I'm not against it, you know, particularly in a state like New York. Uh, what I am against is in, you know, uh, taking over these old coal power plants and, you know, get them going again to power, you know, uh, mining operations. And I think that is, that is a real, the real crime. But I, I, I am not necessarily against blockchain as technology. Uh, I'm against mining and I think it has to be regulated. Uh, it definitely has to be regulated and people need to, you know, need to pay in a way that will incentivize, you know, uh, different options. Um, sorry, I think you might have misunderstood my question a little bit. I was asking about the big blockchain like corporations down in South Meadow Square, w ones that like like I'm thinking of like Walmart and how Ithaca kind of relies on those a lot and, and and relying on those rely on like driving to and from those locations and using a lot of energy along the way. So I was wondering, in your plan, do you propose like changes to that like infrastructure or? And then I was wondering how much those corporations are involved in the in these deal makings. Yeah, uh, I don't know much about the, the crypto companies in Meadow Street that, that you just mentioned. And, and, and if you talk about, you know, the, the corporations the, the, in that strip mall, like the Wegmans, the Walmart, and all of those guys, they, they all, most of them have uh, power purchase agreements for uh, wind and solar. Uh, the problem is that it's out of state in, in, in some cases. So we're talking about uh, really a cop-out. 
So what we are working with them now is on the 24-7 carbon-free electricity to find local sources of renewable energy and, and also having them reduce energy intensity. So we are actively working with them, but the problem is that locally you talk to somebody, but the decision is made by somebody that you don't know somewhere else, and that, is, that makes it complicated being a city government. I hope I answered, I, I hope I understood kind of. <laughs> That brings us to the end of our time. Thank you so much for being with us. Let's join together and give him a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, if any of you still have outstanding questions, uh, Luis will be around for a few more minutes if you wanna come down and ask. Thank you. <laughs>